Hi, this is Larry Harnish. I have been studying the Black Dahlia case since 1996. This is part two of my reaction to Steve Hodell's Zoom presentation to the Sisters in Crime Book Club of Atlanta. Um, this is the Q&A part of Steve's talk. I know this is long, but you don't have to watch the whole thing. Um, you can skip around, come back later. If you're a true believer in Steve Hodell's claims that his dad was a criminal genius and evil mastermind, you may want to watch this. You may find it illuminating. I have edited out the people asking the questions as much as possible because this isn't about them. It's about Steve. Um, I repeat the questions as they were asked. There's one question I left in because um, it's important. Uh, Someone asks, were you living in the Saddam house when Elizabeth Short was killed? Uh, Steve bungles his answer. Uh, he recovers very smoothly. He really is an excellent liar. Uh, okay, once again, this is Steve's story. There is nothing about Elizabeth Short in it at all. It is all about Steve. And notice that it's about Steve being the victim here, uh, which is very strange since he's talking about a whole bunch of murders. But Steve is the victim. I found out this. I found out that. It's very strange. And I should add that I have been fact-checking Steve Hodell since 2003. But even I am amazed by how much he lies. People who don't know the Black Dahlia case, who haven't spent years fact-checking Steve Hodell, cannot imagine how much he lies. It's staggering. He is a 24-7 BS factory. And what's particularly curious is that by Steve Hodell's own admission, uh, Tamar Hodell said George Hodell didn't kill the Black Dahlia. The district attorney's files say George Hodell didn't kill the Black Dahlia. So what is his mission to exonerate but actually convict his dad when everybody says he didn't do it? It's all very, very strange. Well, that's kind of where we're at for now. <laughs> I'm sorry that was a long narrative. Um, but it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot to tell. It, it is. The questioner talks about a justice for Elizabeth Short. What is justice for Elizabeth Short, really? Is it just sort of thoughtlessly repeating Steve Hodell's claims? A lot of times it is. They're just repeating what Steve says. Okay, um, certainly building an empire on the bones of Elizabeth Short is not justice for Elizabeth Short at all. Uh, the questioner says, the house was bugged, that was your house. And Steve will say, yes, you'll hear him say that. Uh, he gets into I Am The Night, which is interesting. He's kind of peeved um, that he didn't get a piece of the action from the I Am The Night. They incorporated all his evil genius, you know, dad was the evil genius, but they didn't actually, uh, he didn't get a piece of the action. I think he's a little peeved about that, uh, which you'll pick up on. Oh, and one correction I should make, um, I said that uh, Tamar handed off Fauna to a washroom attendant in Las Vegas. She handed off Fauna to a washroom attendant in Reno. It is really hard to keep all these details straight. My apologies. Yes, and I, uh, some, of you, some of your viewers may, uh, your members may have seen I Am the Night, yeah. which was a miniseries and it was 95% fiction. It was, I had nothing to do with it. I was not involved in that. It was my, uh, it was supposed to be the life of Fauna Hodel, uh, who was Tamar's daughter. And uh, I should mention, for those of, of you who are, you know, big uh, Tamar fans, that this is a lady who left her baby with a washroom attendant in Las Vegas and said, oh, the washroom attendant being black, said, this baby will turn dark someday. It's like, you're really going to take this lady seriously? I mean, she was a goofball. She was nuts. Let's go ahead. She wrote a book called uh, uh, Someday She'll Die When It's Supposed. Someday She'll Die When It Was. Yeah. Anyway, that was about her life, which is interesting. Well, when my after my publication, they decided, unbeknownst to me, the uh, first time I was aware of it was when I saw the trailer, was, well, let's pull the Black Dot, Steve's investigation of the Black Dot in and fictionalize it. Yes, fictionalize it. Lying about George Hodell has become the family business, Steve, thanks to you. Which they did. So uh, I'm anxious, you know, I, I'm all about getting the truth out there. Yeah. He didn't say that. 
Did he say that? He said that. No, no. It's the one thing you're not about, Steve. It's getting the truth out there. That's the one thing you are not about. And, uh, so I was a little upset with the fictionalization of it because Anna never met my father. She was never at the Southern House until after long after the day. And um, so that was kind of a lot of misrepresentation. But for me, uh, I mean, it's a wonderful home in the sense that it was, as I said earlier, magic time for us kids. You know, it was just uh, fantasy. And, Yes, it was just fantasy, right. You didn't spend a lot of time there, Steve. You were living with your mom. But, you know, to go on. And we loved it. There were all kinds of parties. Of course, Dad was very connected to a lot of the Hollywood elite. No, he wasn't. That's totally imaginary. The whole Dr. Evil, Dr. Bad Guy, uh, Mr. Big in the, in the weird house in the Hollywood, foot, in the Hollywood Hills. The whole e Mr. Evil... Uh, in the weird house in Hollywood Hills, doing strange things, having weird parties, killing lots of people. That's a fantasy. None of that is true. None of it. You know, and Houston at first then would have become, you know, Maltese Falcon had been made. And he was, you know, uh, they, were, they remained very close until that split and, and, and stuff. So, uh, yeah, John Houston and your mom remained very close. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Steve, yes. And of course, I was married to mom earlier. And uh, uh, actually, of the three of them, mom was the, she was a screenwriter, uh, uh, a script doctor, I guess you'd say. And actually, she, if you, for those familiar with Treasure of Sierra Madre, there's that scene with Robert Blake, the little boy, the lottery tickets in the bar. Well, mom wrote that scene. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, I have read the letters, uh, her letters to John Hughes at the Motion Picture Academy, and her ideas for movies are just off the wall bonkers. Uh, she struggled very hard to sell anything. I think maybe she sold a radio script, but I mean, Slim Pickens. Uh, in the stories about her going to jail, she was uh, portrayed as a writer of children's books, uh, just for accuracy's sake. John came to her and said, you got, you got boys. He says, this doesn't work for us. Can you fix it? So she, she actually fixed that scene, which is really cool. Remarkable woman in many respects. Uh, tragic, you know, out of the fire with John into the frying pan with George. Um, she was an alcoholic, but at the same time, a brilliant mind, smarter than both of them put together. And uh, I'm, I hope we can get some of her, the, the positive parts of her out there to the public too, because she was truly remarkable. Let me just point out that when the district attorney's investigator inter interviewed her, she was living over a bait shop on Santa Monica Pier. Just throwing that out there, not living at the Souden House. Oh, oops. Very beautiful woman. Um, here's a, this is, I get this man Ray. However, in her defense, I will say when the district attorney's investigator interviewed her, she said your dad was a fine doctor and he didn't know Elizabeth Short, according to her. Uh, he could have had a lucrative practice. He wasn't interested in that. He was interested in helping people. That's what she said. Uh, let's see. Anyway, um, like I said, Oh, the other thing I might throw in, just, just, okay, here, here's a picture. You can see it. You can see it. You can see it. You can see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a man right photograph. Um, and, and the other thing that's important to realize, it's not just Steve Hodel that's saying, uh, hey, Saul. Oh, goody. Here we have validation from beyond the grave. Conveniently dead people say Steve Hodel's got it. I'm ready. Um, here we have four of the highest uh, LAPD officials and, and law enforcement. And I'll just read you these are direct quotes. Uh, chief Parker, who was our most famous police chief in LAPD, we identified the Black Dahlia suspect. He was a doctor. Okay. Where does that quote come from? I think Steve said he got it from William Parker's barber. You know, I mean, 
would you go into court with something like, oh, well, that's, no, you couldn't. Um, and, and, it, and it is interesting that at this, okay, let's go on. I'll get back to this later. When Chief of Detective Stab Brown, the Black Dog case was solved. He was a doctor who lived on Franklin Avenue in Hollywood. That is utter baloney. He never said that. Show me the quote. Show me where that came from. Show me where he said that. Uh, because then you accuse Fad Brown of covering up the murder, uh, covering up for your dad. So please, let's have the proof. Show me the receipts. Uh, Lieutenant Jemison of the DA's office. We know who the Black Dahlia killer was. He was a doctor, but we didn't have enough to put him away. That's not true either. Frank Jemison's final report in the district attorney's uh, file says that they had George Hodel under surveillance for five and a half weeks. They interviewed a whole ton of people and they could not establish, they, uh, let's see, uh, all of the interviews and the bug tended to eliminate this suspect, okay? Eliminated, as in he didn't do it. That's the final report. Now, Steve Hodel will turn around and say, oh, well, Frank Jemison was a white hat and uh, he was ordered to cover it up yada 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 and turn all all the evidence over to thad brown it's like wait a minute wait a minute steve let me get this right the lapd is lying the district attorney's office is lying the black dolly investigation involved hundreds hundreds of officers from multiple agencies and they're all lying and you're telling the truth really really okay do go on oh, yeah they did uh, and then finally, the under sheriff of Los Angeles, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, speaking of to uh, Downey was his name. The black dye case was solved. It'll never come out. Suspect was a doctor. They all knew in Hollywood involved in abortions. Okay. Now this wasn't a. This was not a sheriff's case. What in the world does it matter what the under sheriff said? And again, I want to see the receipts on that. Who says so? Because you know who says it's not solved? Would you like to know who says the Black Dahlia case is not solved? Because I'll tell you, the LAPD says it's not solved. You know who else says it isn't solved? Michael Conley. I know you have a great big quote on your website about Michael Conley says the Black Dahlia case is solved. No, he says it's not solved. And should I bring up James Elroy just for the heck of it? No, you know what James Elroy thinks. So these are all independent, separate statements by all of the top law enforcement. So the, the truth is the case was solved, is solved. No, it's not solved. It is not solved, Steve. You just want it to be solved. It's not. But not clear. So that's the difference. And uh, LAPD, there's, and there's a lot more to it. Back then, LAPD was very corrupt. No, it wasn't. No, no, no. Okay. The... Reality time, because reality is where we all live. The Black Dahlia case was a state-of-the-art investigation for 1947. When you push, push the LAPD was corrupt, you bring up Brenda Allen, which was investigated by Vice. It was a special Vice squad operating out of the chief's office. Robbery, at that time, robbery and homicide weren't together. It was just homicide. Uh, homicide, the homicide division did a state-of-the-art investigation. The lead detective on that, Harry Hansen, carried that from the day he went to the crime scene to the day he retired in the 60s. So don't tell me the LAPD was corrupt and covered up because that's bullshit, Steve Hodell. Harry Hansen did not cover up that case. Finest Brown did not cover up that case. Jack Donahoe didn't cover up those cases. Nobody covered up that case. Didn't happen. As were Chicago, as were all of the departments. And Parker came along and wanted to clean up Dodge. And uh, he was oh, historical note they brought in a Marine general named William Horton uh, for a year after the, the chief, the World War II chief Clemens Horrell uh, left. Uh, he, he retired to protect his pension. And so they brought in a Marine general for a year named William Horton. And he investigated the department and he found, yeah, there's a few bad actors, but in generally the department is, is clean. And he was followed by this competition between 
William Parker and Thad Brown. Um, and I'm not sure the department needed to be cleaned up as much as you think it did. Um, it, the police department under Parker had a lot of problems, uh, but you never bought your way out of a traffic ticket in LA. That never happened, uh, that kind of thing, uh, like Chicago. It was never, it was never uh, like on the take, that kind of graph. The most corruption you would find in Los Angeles was job selling. And that was somewhat common for, for civic jobs in those days. Uh, and it continued, the practice continued for a long time. Uh, but in terms of that sort of corruption, nah. You might find a few. Um, vice is always tempting uh, for certain officers. They can't resist uh, the stuff. But in general, uh, no, no, absolutely not. I will defend the LAPD on that 100%, not crooked. It's literally weeks away from when, that, when the thing with tape recording went down. And so they basically covered it up. He wanted to take off office. What? What did you say? He knew if this came out, it would blow him out of a suspect was a doctor. They all knew him all over the Let's run that again. So these are all independent, separate statements by yeah. all of the top law enforcement. So the, the truth is the case was solved, is solved, but not cleared. So that's the difference. And uh, LAPD, there's, and there's a lot more to it. Back then, the LAPD was very corrupt as with Chicago, as were all of the departments. And Parker came along and wanted to clean up Dodge. And uh, he was literally weeks away from when, that, when this thing with the tape recordings went down. And so they basically covered it up. He wanted to take off office. He knew if this came out, it would blow him out of the water. Steve. What better way to establish your credentials, your reputation as a police chief than to break the Black Dahlia case? What are you saying? It's the exact opposite, okay? If you wanna make your reputation as a police chief, you bust this famous case, come on. That doesn't even make remote, that doesn't even make any sense at all. It's ridiculous. So they just locked it away and never came back to it. For the good of the city, for the good of themselves, the department. How is an unsolved murder good for anybody? What are you talking about? And uh, so it wasn't until 53 years later that we get the secret files. Okay, question number two. Things did get cleaned up. Your father was able to continue his crime spree. Steve's talking about uh, the LAPD was corrupt, all the police departments were corrupt. And that isn't really true. It's really misleading to say that. Um, the LA department was pretty clean. As, as I indicated in the previous video, um, the LAPD had a problem in the 1930s with selling jobs. That was not particularly uncommon in that era. And, and, and it went on for a while. Uh, but in terms of bribery to get out of this, that, or the other thing, you never bought your way out of a traffic ticket the way you would in Chicago. I mean, in, in that sense, um, the LAPD was, was, you know, was pretty clean. Uh, people will talk about the Brenda Allen scandal. Okay, that was a few vice cops. That certainly was not homicide. Brenda Allen was never suspected of killing anybody, and she was never investigated by the Homicide Bureau. And I should point out that Harry Hansen, the lead detective from day one until he retired. Okay, there was never any question about him being crooked or he was as straight as an arrow. And so the idea that, oh, well, the LAPD was curtain, that's Steve Hodel nonsense. The, blood on their hands is there would be the imaginary crime spree that exists only in the mind of Steve Hodel and nowhere else. No Zodiac. And not Zodiac. No, 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 not Zodiac. No. Lucilla, Lucilla, and Manila. You know, yeah, that's where, and that's where, you know, I, as a career law enforcement officer, my blood boils on the on the fact that they they didn't pursue it. Sure. And okay, question number three. 
what was the emotional impact of investigating your father? And the questioner is, now you don't have to talk about this if you don't want to. Well, of course, there's nothing that Steve Hodel doesn't want to talk about. So he goes into all of that. Spill it, Steve, spill your guts. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a, a real challenge for me because as you say, I was a loving son and I was determined to, but at the same time, you know, I was also a trained, skilled homicide investigator. Yeah, you're such a trained investigator, you can't even get the name right for where Elizabeth Short's body was found. That's what a skilled investigator you are. Come on, Steve. So it was, in a way, I was psychologically bisected as Elizabeth was physically in the sense of you've got the loving son who's determined that he's going to show his father had nothing to do with it. You've got the trained objective detective, homicide detective, who's going to follow the evidence. And so I had to make that different, you know, I had to make that, uh, just keep them separate. You know, I couldn't allow the son to contaminate whatever evidence the detective was going to find. So it was a, it was two paths. And the other thing was, I knew very little about my father. He was very mysterious. How is it you know all... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You were very close to your dad, but you didn't know anything about him. How is that possible? How could you be very close to your dad and not know anything about him? Steve, that doesn't even remotely make sense. I had everything that I've related to you, basically, I, I didn't know him. I, I had to find out on my journey. So it was two paths. It was a son following a path to discover who his mysterious father was and another path of a criminal investigation. So, you know, it, it uh, and to this day, you know, I've been through every possible emotion you can go through. Um, anger, hatred, uh, you know, frustration. Uh, and basically now, I, after 23 years of investigation, I've just wound up with just a terrible sadness, you know, and, and uh, this boy genius, clearly there had to, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that he was a victim of probably incest, probably his mother. Steve, you're just pulling that out of thin air. There's absolutely no basis for that whatsoever. If not his mother, or fa another family member, you know, and his rejection, you know, he's a, he got a young boy, you know, genius, and his peers are rejecting him. He's just wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You never interest, introduced anything about his peers rejecting him. Where did that come from? Where? Where did that come from? You know? Where did... kid, you know. And, and so there are a whole lot of things and a lot of stuff we'll never know. Okay. My best take on George Hodel, uh, he was a rich kid. The parents had money. The dad was in real estate. Steve's grandfather was in real estate. And, and you know, comfortably middle class. And they had a bright kid. Um, and he had a lot of um, arty sort of bohemian um, interests. Uh, he didn't really have the talent to be a, a painter, a photographer, or a writer, or anything like that. But he sort of dabbled in that stuff. And he, you know, he had a good enough living as a doctor that, that could support that. And, and that's my basic take on, on George Hodel, uh, not this other weird, crazy stuff that Steve's got. The impact of his life that created this monster. And, and uh, I mean, there's never, I, I'm not aware of anyone that's been any clear to equal to him in the sense of what he did you know, for 50 years. But it's all made up. It's all made up. You have created this sort of modern day Moriarty that doesn't exist in real life. There is no Professor Moriarty. He doesn't exist. He's fictional. The, the persona that you created for your dad, that's fictional. 100% fiction. And uh, you say he got away. Well, he didn't really get away with it. They knew. And, and there were other ones. In, in the early years, the same thing. We come across corruption and, and overlooking it and, and ignoring it. And, you know, where uh, he should have been arrested. So, and the sad thing is, in the early years, the horrific one, if it wasn't bad enough with William Hiram, 64 years for a crime that Dad did, there was actually some executions in the early years where a, a, a a, a wrongful suspect is executed on a crime. Day. So, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm, 
an advocate against the death penalty. Now that's interesting. It's interesting to have a police officer who's against the death penalty. Good for you. I applaud that. I actually applaud that. Well, and it's basically because of wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. anyway, that's uh, by crummy police work, Steve. Perhaps. But yeah, psychologically, uh, I mean, it's been. I guess it's been therapeutic for me to to write. And, you know, I I never intended to be a writer. You know, I, okay, that's not true either. I will out Steve Hodell. Um, we have a newspaper story that after he left the LAPD, he attended a mystery writing conference. So that is utter BS. He wanted to be a writer. Um, I have the receipts, even if you don't, Steve. I mean, I was pulled into this. It, this came to me. I didn't go to it. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, it's been, I guess, a way therapeutic to, to, to through my writings. I do cover quite a bit of personal uh, psychological examinations and stuff too in my, in my writings. Talk it. I won't say it. I was going to say it. I won't say it. Steve. Would you talk about your transition from being an investigator to deciding to write a book? Well, I wasn't, I, I, I went, when I went to the DA. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. And submitted my evidence. And I thought, well, if he comes back, you know, um, with uh, not enough, uh, I'll just go back to Bellingham, move back to Bellingham and, and, and resume my work. But he, but I also knew I'd made the case. So No, you didn't make the case. You did not make the case. I have talked to somebody who was in that meeting with Steve Cooley and they just rolled their eyes about you and Stephen Kay. Okay, and you know who I'm talking about also. They just roll their eyes, Steve. So when he came back and said, yeah, I'd file on these. At that point, I said, okay, well, I, I've got to tell this story. I'm going to write it. And, and um, you, you, you develop writing skills as an investigator, of course, because you're presenting crimes to the district attorney all the time. And maybe I got some of my mother's writing genes. Uh, and anyway, I decided to tell the story. and. Um, because it's, it's, it's an important story and, and uh, it, it's far strange, this, you know, fact, far stranger than fiction. And uh, you couldn't make this up. I don't even... <laughs> oh, yes, you can, Steve. You can make it up. You can make it all up. Every word of it. Yes, you can. Mind we even go there. So I just sat down and, and basically after the DA said, get the green light on the prosecutor. Uh, I sat down and just wrote it up. The first one, I had no idea that it would be seven books, eight books later, you know, with all of these other crimes that kept unfolding. And the other thing I want to say is I had an amazing, I had a lot of help from a lot of readers. They were armchair detectives, if you will. And oh, oh, oh. oh, the armchair detectives looking for thought prints. Yes, yes. Where's Luigi? Some of these men and women could be my partner anytime and I include them in and I present what their findings were. And some of them are just, well, of course, we talked about the, the Frenchman, you know, Yves Persson, who came up with the solution on the uh, cipher on Zodiac. But, but there were all kinds of individual citizen readers who came up with, well, what about this and stuff that I had missed? They thought. So it's, it's a really a... <laughs> A joint effort by many readers that have contributed amazing, amazing uh, discoveries. The questioner asks, did you ever think about stopping your investigation because it was so painful to discover your father wasn't who you thought he was? And the answer, well, Steve Hodell will give the answer. But I mean, remember that Steve Hodell is all over the map on his dad. I knew, I knew my dad. I was very close to him. I didn't know him at all. He was this monster. He was a misogynist. He was this and that. Um, Steve, it, it really is, in Steve Hodell's telling, hard to get a grip on exactly who he thinks George Hodell was. Or thought about Short it. Answer, no. No. Uh, no. Basically, no. You know, I'm no. wired to no. pursue the truth. Um, well, he was wired. Um, uh, were the other books necessary? I mean, Steve Hodell could have stopped at Black Dahlia Avenger and people would have probably bought it. Where, where he really goofed up 
is continuing to write, continuing to do appendixes and new editions and all that stuff. And you'll notice that Steve's books now are, are all self-published. No publisher will touch them, you know? In every case, in every homicide case, <clears throat> you kind of have to remove the emotional part of you from your investigation. So in a way you could say I was well prepared, even though it was my father, I was well prepared, you know, just by the hundreds of investigations I've done is to remove myself. You know, you get that 2 a.m. call, you go in and a father is beating his six-year-old son to death. And he's in custody and you go in and you sit down and give him a cup of coffee, a cigarette, and let's talk about this. So, so you know, you have to remove that anger and, and repulsion or you're not going to, you're not going to get, make your case very well. So in a way I was kind of prepared from the get-go. The question is, now the Black Dahlia murder, it happened before you were born, correct? No, after, okay. I was six years old. Okay, were you living in that house when it happened? Yes. You were? Well, well not, not during the crime. We, the DA would... Oh, that's an interesting question. Were you living in the Souden house when Elizabeth Short was killed? Yes. No, wait, no. Uh, <laughs> which is it, Steve? Were you living there or not? That was one of the things that bothered me. How, how he couldn't commit a crime with mother and children there. Well, in the DA reports, it actually shows that we were not there during the three week period. It doesn't show that in the DA report, Steve. You're full of it. That's not there. Unlike everybody else, I have the DA reports. It's not there. Um, no telling where you and your mom and your brothers were living, but you were not living at the Souden house. Nope. He was there alone, but we were actually living with my mother's brother, so my, my uncle, uh, for that during that period in uh, in uh, January of '47. We were actually gone for three weeks, so he was there alone. Hey, remember that originally Steve said he and his parents and his brothers moved into the Souden house, and George was the king, and his mom was the queen, and they were the little princes, and everything was fine. Um, and as Steve goes on, the story becomes somewhat changed, and you'll see him sort of, well, okay, we were kind of transient, we were in and out of there, uh, but one of the questions was when Steve is talking about the Souden house, kind of a follow-up to, uh, I think the question is, was he living there when uh, Elizabeth Short was killed, and he said, no, no, we, we were out those three weeks, and he'll say, um, it's in the files. Well, it's not in the files. This garbage. Uh, but the questioner asked, when you had moved out of the house, was that a family vacation? That's the question. He lived just three miles away. So we were in Los Angeles. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we, were, we were kind of in and out a lot. Mom was uh, transient. And, um, um, yeah, that's the real story. Mom was, we were in and out. Mom was transient. That's the real story. Not they were living there at the Souden house and they were all princes in this fantasy. They were in and out of there. That's true. Another thing I discovered is that they were actually divorced. I didn't know. Uh, they married in uh, 39 and were divorced in 44 or 45. So we were kind of living there at his will and stuff. And I didn't know that. I just assumed when he left in 50, we were, mom was still married to him. But I actually discovered the divorce papers and stuff. He didn't leave in 50. He left in 51. But again, you're a cop. You're good with details. Uh, and were, so we were kind of transit in and out. You know, mostly, mostly stayed there a lot. But, and mom had some drinking problems. And we were actually taken into custody a couple of times for child neglect. Uh, of now, that's actually all true. That is all true. And if I have to fault the George Hodel for anything, it's not getting custody of Steve and his brothers. That was, he screwed up there. He should have done that. He didn't, I, and I, I don't have an answer for that. He should have done that because Steve's mom was just a, just a drunk. You know, she'd go out of binge and stuff. So it was, I, I write a whole chapter or two on the gypsy years. We kind of bounced all around after that split, you know, and, and it was a, it was a tough time, and that's, I joined the Navy at 17 when I turned 17 in seven seconds. You know. So, uh, 
yeah, so it was a good and bad thing. You know. But the questioner asks, did he do the torture and murder in that house? And you know what Steve Hodel is going to say. Of course, there's absolutely nothing to prove that uh, anybody was killed in that house, not Elizabeth Short or anybody else. Yes. In fact, um, since then, again, like I say, the ongoing investigation, I actually had an opportunity to have a, a canine a cadaver dog. Oh, Buster the Three-Legged Cadaver Dog. Yeah, I got to love Buster the Three-Legged Cadaver Dog. Buster, fat, you know, indicated or... Um, what is it? Um, uh, uh, human remains, okay? But all of Elizabeth Short is buried up in Oakland, so there's nothing to find, um, you know, but okay. Uh, actually uh, alerted to human rem human uh, remains at the Soden house in the basement. And uh, we got soil samples. We sent those into the body farm. Yeah, that guy was such a... It was uh, Paul Dosty, the, the dog guy, you know, he's kind of shady. And the doctor doing the analysis of the professor, whoever he was, he's even shadier. I mean, these guys are just so sketchy, you know. And they came back positive for human remains. Uh, but so what? It's not Elizabeth Short. All of Elizabeth Short, except for was, what was removed during the medical exam, the autopsy, is buried in Oakland. There is not, There was nothing of her to be buried buried in the basement. Not possible. And, you know, it's never been very frustrating for me because I poured some of... Reality can be frustrating, Steve. It can, yes. ...close to LAPD, and the detective assigned to the case says, well, we're, we're too busy to look at it. Well, the truth is they, they do not want to confirm. LAPD wants no part of this. They don't want to confirm that their two greatest heroes, Chief... Well, okay, the LAPD says the case isn't solved. The LAPD doesn't want to waste time on people who, can, uh, who accuse their dad of killing Elizabeth Short. Uh, the LAPD, as you ought to understand as a detective, uh, is interested in investigating and pursuing cases that will re a result in an arrest and a conviction. Will Will an investigation of the Black Dahlia case result in a arrest and a conviction? No, it'll just make a true crime author some bucks. So of course they don't. Arthur T. Fab Brown basically covered this up. Now wait a minute, Steve. I this is a problem that I have. Um, you accuse these chiefs of covering it up, and yet you say you you claim that they say you solved the case. So which is it? Which is it? I mean, it, it's like they covered it up, but they didn't cover it up. I don't know. I don't get it. And the kicker, and I, uh, I forgot to mention this, but actually the reason for it is there was a murder on... Oh, no, 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 no. Here we go to the transcripts. No, 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 no. Tape. Wire. It's a wire recording, Steve, not tape. During this six-week... Uh, Five and a half. Taping. Wire recording. It's actually a murder committed. No. I, I'm reading the transcript and I can't believe it. It's that I can't believe it either, Steve. George Odell and Baron Haringa go downstairs uh, to the basement. A thud is heard. A woman screams. Four blows are heard. A woman screams again. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, they're, they're six minutes away from the house in Hollywood. Why aren't they out the door and doing a rescue? Because they're not stupid. That's why. You know, th your dad knew that the microphones were in the house. They were putting on a show for the cops. And what was your dad doing an hour after supposedly murdering a woman? He was typing. He, your dad did a lot of typing. And the other question is, okay, this woman was killed in the Soden house? Okay, who is she? We know exactly when this woman was killed, supposedly. Um, who is she? Where's the body? Did they ever find her? Was she a missing person? I mean, come on. You're just, oh, well, this woman was killed. Come on, man. Jeez, at least try. They do nothing. Why? Hard to say. I, 
They're not stupid. That's why. I can only I can only assume that you know basically we the third day of the investigate the stakeout. You know, detectives say, "What do we do? Should we call the lieutenant? And, you know, do what do we do?" And like, maybe try to. Oh come on, come on. Please, Steve, don't embarrass yourself like this. To call him, wasn't home or whatever, and basically they did nothing. So basically, I think this was the main reason for the cover up. Oh, now this is interesting. This is really, really, really interesting. If you closely follow Steve Hiddell, now the original reason for the cover up was because his dad. Now remember, think way, 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 way back into the deep dark past of 45 minutes or wherever we were an hour, uh, an hour ago that his dad ran a VD clinic in downtown LA. Now, Steve's original claim was that his dad knew who had VD and if they arrested him, he would expose all these movers and shakers who had STDs. And so they were afraid to arrest him, of course, for th this horrible murder. So of course, as we know, VD is worse than murder, right? Okay, is, th is that where you Okay, so Steve has now changed his story. It's like they covered it up because uh, they did nothing during this murder of this woman who was never identified and was never reported missing. And it's like, it, it is just pulling stuff out of the air, right and left. Was that, and you don't understand the corruption and the timing of LA, Parker was literally weeks away from assuming command. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me point out again, that they brought in the Marine General uh, for a year, William Wharton, okay, um, as in the interim. And his whole thing was checking, at, checking the department, doing internal affairs, making sure that everybody was on the straight and narrow, okay? Don't forget your LAPD history. It's important. Clean up jobs. I think midnight oil was burnt and they made this Machiavellian decision while well, let's you know, lock this away for now, we'll come back to it in the future, but for now, let's I'll take the man and we'll clean up Dodge. No. I think that's what happened. I don't think that's what and, happened. Uh, but, I mean, it's quite remarkable that they recorded for another five weeks. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so. the, the transcripts are really, really dull. Um, there, there are descriptions of the music that George Hodel listens to. There's typing. Uh, and I should point out that Sex fiend George Hodel, actually, the housekeeper wants to have sex with maniacal George, and he says, no, 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 not tonight, no. So, I mean, you have sex fiend George turning it down uh, from the housekeeper. Uh, it's, on, it's in the transcript, you know. I mean, it's dull. Believe me, it's dull. Really, really dull. Oh, and I should point out one other thing that's very important that shows just how much Steve Hodel manipulates what's in the transcript. At one point, one of the operators says they're having it trouble with the equipment. That's the wire recorder, not the tape recorder, the wire recorder having trouble with the equipment. And Steve will take that line and say, oh, he attributes it to his dad saying, I'm in trouble. Okay, not even. Okay, that is who you're dealing with. Again, um, this is how cops lie. It's a master class in how police officers lie. A questioner points out that Tamar and Fauna say George Hodel didn't kill Elizabeth Short. Steve says, well, uh, Tamar didn't, said he didn't do it. So again, why is Steve trying to exonerate his dad when Tamar says he didn't do it? Do you, do you recall that? No. Uh, Ta Tamar, when I'm talking to her on the phone, on my disclosure, she says to me, you know, yeah, he was a suspect in the black guy, but he didn't do it, she says. Oh. And, 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 and uh, so she definitely believed he didn't do it. And and uh, I said, well, what, you know, what, where is this coming from, Tamar? She says, well, the detectives, that, the LAPD detectives that took me to court back and forth during the trial said they thought he was the killer of the Black Dahlia. Well, Tamar, you know, there's some other woman that said her uh, wrote a book, My Daddy Was the Black Dahlia Killer. Oh, yes, Janice Knowlton. 
This is the fruit of the poisonous tree where all roads lead to the Black Dahlia. Janice Knowlton was this crazy lady um, who thought her dad, George Knowlton, killed the Black Dahlia. And she collaborated with a true crime author named Michael Newton. And so they did this book together. And half the book is Janice Knowlton talking about all this weird stuff her dad supposedly did. And Michael Newton is trying to be, you know, it's like, okay, I have this document, I have this document. So there's this real disunity. But anyway, uh, Janice Knowlton was just crazy. And anytime something uh, turned up in the paper about the Black Dahlia case, she would, she would call and leave me a, a, like a two minute voicemail message. Uh, and I used to make fun of her. She's in James Elroy's My Dark Places as the Black Dahlia lady. He used to make fun of her too. And then she committed suicide and, and it was really, really sad. Um, I, you know, I mean, it's just, um, she just went bonkers. Uh, so anyway, that's Janice Knowlton. But interesting that Tamar and Janice Knowlton got together. I mean, it's like, what a perfect match that was. Janice Knowlton at the Columbus. Yeah. Well, she, Tamar contacted her and, and apparently she said, no, my daddy did it. My daddy's name is George. <laughs> oh, you know, that's interesting because that's not what happened either, Steve. Um, Janice Knowlton floated a question on Usenet, on the internet. If you remember the Usenet in the old day, hey, what do people know about George Hodel and the Black Dahlia case? It was not, oh, no, no, my dad did it. It was like this whole other thing. I have, I have her message, so I can, I can show that. I have the receipt, Steve. I can prove what happened. So, Tamar just assumed that her dad did it. I won't say what Tamar's opinion of Black Dolly Avenger was when it came out. I will only say that my understanding at least is that she didn't know about the book because Steve wrote it in total secrecy. And let us say she was taken aback, uh, like Duncan, uh, when when the when the book came out. I'll leave it at that. Saw the truth of it. A questioner asks, "What do your siblings think of your claims?" And Steve goes through his three brothers, the oldest one having died a long time ago, uh, Tamar, etc. And he talks about the. He doesn't talk at all about Duncan. Steve and Duncan have a lot of bad blood. Duncan was so furious with Steve after Black Dolly Avenger was published, he stopped talking to him, never talked to him again. Uh, remember that Duncan was the one who testified in behalf of George Hodel that Tamar said, well, I'm going to make up this lie about dad molesting Lee. So there is a lot of bad blood there. And as Steve barely mentions Duncan. So that's the unanswered question. Well, like I say, there's a, a, 11 children. And uh, so Tamar passed away, but she was on, totally on board. That's what a few years ago. Um, my two full brother, my, my brother, older brother, Mike, passed away before any of this came to life. Uh, he was a remarkable individual uh, himself. Anyway, and my younger brother, Kelly, is uh, totally on board. He's uh, Irish twins. He's, 11 months younger than me. And uh, the, the four Filipino children, no, uh, that wasn't our dad. He couldn't, he couldn't do something like that. Yeah, that's true. That is actually true. The Filipino branch of the Hodel family really hates uh, all the stuff about George Hodel, serial killer. A lot of bad blood there. So they're not on board. To say the uh, least. And uh, <clears throat> I, I mean, I don't know. Now that all the evidence is out, I haven't had communication with him. So, you know, it's kind of mixed, half and half, I guess. And the uh, problem is you got to kind of read all eight or nine books to get the full picture. And then, you only have to read one, Steve, to know you're full of it. You only have to read one. A lot of people aren't willing to read nine books, you know. Uh, it's one on book. It's really one on book investigation. And that's why I'm hoping that the miniseries will condense it to you know, uh, make it understandable and, and, and uh, cover it 
that we did with Cam in what, four or five episodes. I don't know. So. Someone points out that George Hodel had a heart condition. I have no direct knowledge of whether George Hodel had a heart condition. I am told by people who have researched that phase of his life more than I have, that yes, George did indeed have a heart condition. Um, I need to correct something that I said uh, in terms of overdosing. Uh, I say it would argue uh, for George Hodel overdosing his secretary. What I meant to say was that would argue against him overdosing his secretary. Uh, it's fantasy. I mean, if you want to, uh, if you want to commit suicide with sleeping pills, you need a lot of tablets and you need alcohol. Tablets by them. I mean, tablets by themselves may not do it. Tablets plus alcohol was the way to go. Yeah. I mean, he, he had a heart condition, but he was. He was also very physically fit, and he, he used that as a kind of an excuse. In, other words, in the summer of 40, 49, when Tamar came down, uh, he argued, he says, oh, you know, I have a heart condition. You know, I, I, I don't want to take care of her and stuff. He definitely didn't want Tamar in Los Angeles. He definitely, George Hodel was not set up to be a dad. Uh, he was not interested. That part of it is true. Um, the fact that it was Tamar um, probably double. George Hodel really didn't seem to be very interested in his kids, um, at least, you know, the ones we know about with any, with any detail. Um, that I don't understand, you know. Anyway, Tamar's mother insisted, and, and he did. And he kind of, he never really had any weight in life he did. But he was very active and very strong, a very powerful man, mm -hmm. physically. And uh, he never really had uh, until eighties. He was, he was, you know, he'd come up and visit. He and Jean would come up and visit me regularly. I would visit them in San Francisco in that last decade. And uh, he was strong and powerful. Ultimately, he did have have a it worsened and worsened, and finally they he did. A, they did a attempted to a fibrillation or whatever it was to try and it didn't work. So actually he committed suicide. Yeah, I don't know about that. I haven't done my homework on whether that's true. Steve is so careless with details and so um, willing to bend the truth that I would I would want to see his death certificate before I I believe that. And I haven't done it yet. Uh, he took uh, I know he wrote prescriptions second offer June, in which he accumulated enough of them. He uh, he overdosed himself. And oh no! Wait a minute, Steve. Wait a minute. Didn't you say that your dad overdosed Ruth Spaulding, and yet he had to accumulate all all these sleeping tablets or these sleeping pills before he could kill himself? Doesn't it take kind of a lot of sleeping pills to kill yourself? You know, pretty sure it took it takes kind of like a bottle of sleeping pills and a lot of alcohol, um, which argues pretty strongly that he just sort of overdosed uh, his secretary. But you know, people people don't pay attention; they just let you go. All right, please continue. It was not a remorse; it was because it's. He was fearful that he would be paralyzed and you know, eat up all their savings. And June, June was 40 years younger than him. She was younger than me. And they were married 30 years. So uh, he basically decided, you know, he even talked to me about what I thought about euthanasia. I said, well, I said, there are certainly conditions when it's appropriate, I think, you know. And anyway, and that was like a year or two before. Anyway, he took his life, but he was. He was actually quite strong and powerful in his, up until about his 80s. And then there was, you know, but certainly in 47, he was, you know, no, no problems. Oh, and, but he yeah. was 60, he was what, 69, so he was 62. And I think, and I think he's also, that's when June ended his life. And got him off the booze, got him off the cigarettes, 
you know, eating healthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think she was a huge influence on turning mm -hmm. them around. The questioner asks, how responsible was your father for his children? And they, he means financially. Um, not a lot in terms of uh, Steve and his brothers and his mom. I don't think he got a lot of, I don't think they got a lot of money, financial support from George. I don't know what the agreement was, but you have to stop and ask yourself, well, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait a minute. If George was rolling in dough, if, dough, if he was wealthy and powerful, why wasn't he giving money to Dorothy and the kids? Um, it's an interesting question. Steve doesn't really answer that. And while I'm on the subject of, of Steve's mom, I should point out that Steve is very willing to throw her under the bus in terms of, uh, oh yeah, she helped dad cover up this crime. They were having wild sex parties, none of which is true. Uh, none of that is all at all true. Zero. Uh, it's pretty weird. I, don't, I can't speak to the Filipino side, but they didn't need any help. Uh, his wife, uh, Hortensia Stark, was a congresswoman in the Philippines and very wealthy. She owned a large uh, uh, plantation in south of Manila in, in Negros, Occidental. And so she was very wealthy. Uh, her, uh, I think she was a cousin to the vice president. Uh, uh, earlier in the earlier years. So th there was no financial problem on, on that side. Uh, as far as helping mom, not really. He, he never really paid. He was supposed to pay 200 a month or something back when they were divorced in the 40s. Mm -hmm. But uh, he never really, uh, uh, occasionally he'd send you know, a little money. Okay, now that's sort of interesting. Uh, what we have in the Motion Picture Academy Library in the John Houston papers is lots and lots of letters of her of Dorothy Hodel asking John Houston for money. And he was pretty generous with them. He bought like Christmas presents for the boys, like Steve and his brothers and stuff. Um, she, she managed to get a lot of money, a, a fair amount of money out of John Houston. What she was getting from George Hodel, I have no idea, none whatsoever. But not on any regular basis. So mom was left to fame for herself and, and it was tough times for us. That, um, that is actually true. That is absolutely true. That's what happened. Yes. And he wasn't, you know, he had this image of being very wealthy. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. You know, the 39th floor penthouse suite. No, we know what his address was, Steve. He did not live on the penthouse. He didn't have a penthouse suite. He did not have a view of the cemetery where Elizabeth Short was buried. That is all bogus. No. San Francisco and all that. The truth is, when I got into it, actually, I was made executive of, the, of his uh, state with Jim, or Jim Helton, and we both did it. And he actually had, you know, maybe, I think it was 400000 which well, sounds like a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money in today's world. Well, it's not a lot of money divided among 11 kids, Steve. Um, no. Right. Everybody thinks he's a billionaire or multi-millionaire. He, mm -hmm. he spent it as fast as he got it. Ah, now you see, here's where we finally get down to the root cause of Black Dolly Avenger. All the kids thought George was going to leave them a lot of money, and they didn't. And so what do they do? They turn George into a little cash machine. We'll make him a little cash cow. We'll come up with the uh, George Hodel Criminal Genius franchise and we'll just sell books and go on TV. He didn't leave us any money, so we'll, we'll make our money off him that way. And that really is it. Lying about George Hodel is the family business these days. A questioner asks, since he wasn't convicted, was there any restitution? Then I'll just. He was, he, to this day, LAPD says it's an unsolved case. It's yeah. not unsolved. And, uh, yes, it is unsolved, Steve. Yes, yes, yes. Unsolved. It is solved. No. But, you know, they're not going to acknowledge it. And, they, and I've asked them four times 
through three chiefs now changing over the years to just you know do the DNA. Let's you know let's do you know here's the case and and do the DNA off what? What are you going to compare it to? What on earth are you going to compare it to, Steve? You're a comp. You're supposed to know this stuff. You would need something from the killer in order to do the DNA. Okay. Now let me point out for you of all the prank of all the letters that were received by the cops and the newspapers and everybody else, only one, only one, the first one with her Elizabeth Short's belongings was considered legitimate. All the rest of them were pranks. So there is no DNA to compare. And as a police officer and as a detective, you should know that there's no DNA to compare. There isn't any. They don't want me part of it because again, they don't want to confirm. So all I can do is, and what they do is say, we're too busy for working on active cases. We're too busy to work on it. Questioner asks, have you been in contact with the families of any of the victims? That's an interesting question because again, uh, Steve says, oh, well, Elizabeth Short's sisters are all dead. They're not, they're alive. They think he's a scam artist and really hate the fact that he is profiting off of their tragedy. And he sure hasn't talked to them, especially since they say the photograph isn't her, his, his precious photograph isn't Elizabeth Short. He's never, he's never checked it with them. Oh. Oh, take 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 a moment and pause on this one, Steve. One of the victims, the San Diego victim, are some relatives I was in contact with. But I have a Elizabeth Short's family. Uh, she had four sisters, and they're all have passed. No, they're not dead, Steve. Elizabeth, several of Elizabeth Short's sisters are still alive, and they, they and they think you're full of crap. That's the truth. Um, they think you're a scam artist. They think you're exploiting their tragedy uh, with this crazy claim that your dad killed her, killed her with these bogus pictures that aren't her. That's what Elizabeth Short's sisters, who are still alive, think. Okay. And basically, you know, all kinds of books came out and stuff and stuff. I, you know, solving the case. But, 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 no, I didn't talk to them. No, I didn't show them the pictures. No, I didn't talk to anybody before. No, you didn't talk to anybody before you wrote the book. And it's especially, you didn't ask to see your dad's LAPD file before you wrote your book. They would have showed it to you. It's that simple. You didn't ask. Now they don't want to show it to you because you accused the department of cover-ups and everything else. Of course, they're not going to show it to you. They'll never show it to you. So I think they were just sick and tired of of hearing anything, and they didn't want any any card or connection with anybody. So I figured if they want to contact me, fine. You know, but no, there's there's been no real contact. Don't hold your breath. Uh, another question about reconciling the man you knew with the man who did this. Uh, again, Steve's take on his father is all over the map. He knew him well. Uh, he was close to him. He didn't really know him at all, and it's it's weird. <laughs> uh, basically, I mean, I, I knew Dad was you know had his problems, and I knew that. But mainly, it was wait, 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 wait. Now, first of all, you said you and your dad were close, and then you said you didn't know him very well. He was, a, and then and now you say you knew he had his problems. Which is it? Which which is it? Get your story straight. Sexual. I mean, he was, you know, I, I knew he was good for the incest with Tamar. No, 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 no. That was Tamar lying. And uh, you know, he was a, you know, a serial marriage. <laughs> he was very he was a powerful force in his life. But I never dreamt he could be that you know the misogynist, the nihilist, and all of that. I, I never had it insight into that until I got into the crimes themselves and, and you know, realized you know, how pathologically messed up he was. So uh, it, it was hard for me to uh, go from loving son to discovering this monster, you know, uh, but it's, you know, part of 
it's also been you know, the detective in me, the <clears throat> guy that wants to solve crimes and, and uh, you know, discover who done it. Uh, it's been exciting. I mean, frankly, it's been it's been rewarding to discover uh, and link the, and solve these crimes. They're not solved, Steve. Only only in your mind are these crimes solved. Not in reality. Not in reality, which is where we live. Well, that's that's what I did my whole career. And so that part of me was, I have to admit, was... I, I should point out that Brian Carr, who was at that time custodian of the Black Dahlia case, said, if I went into court, if, if I went in with a case like Steve Hodel's, I would be laughed out of court. So, no. You know, interested and, and determined, you know, determined uh, to, to get to the truth of it. I'm a questioner asked, if this had come to you while your father was still alive, do you think you would have still investigated the case? No. Why would he do that? Uh, Steve could only make this case after his dad was conveniently dead, um, which is what he did. I don't think I don't think I I don't think it would have I could could have solved it within living. I, I don't think I'd be able to. No, because he'd tell you you're wrong, Steve. Of course not. It's only when he's conveniently dead then you can then you can prove. Anything you want. I found out the things I discovered. That, or the, you know, I talked to a lot of people. And I had a lot of help. And a lot of that may not have been revealed where he's still alive. He was a powerful force uh, for evil. And he was, you know, people were scared of him. I mean. Give me one example of people being afraid of your dad. One example. One. One example of somebody saying, I was afraid of George Hodel. Other than Tamar, who, you know, well, first of all, she's dead. Second of all, you can't believe a word she says. But I mean, other than that, who said, oh, yeah, I was afraid of George Hodel, you know. There was that whole inner circle, Houston, and uh, a lot of the screenwriters and others back in those days knew. Actually, you know, all of the surrealists knew that he did it. There's a whole... No, 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 no. No, stop saying that all these dead people knew your dad killed the Black Dahlia. It's all a lie. All of it. Multiple chapters where I present, but they actually pay the serial, the serialists, Man Ray and others, pay Copley and uh, pay homage to George through artwork, acknowledging that they knew that he was the killer. So this is just a, was another whole thing. And, and they were all, you know, in fear of their lives. None of them were. Nobody wanted contact with. Okay, okay. Man Ray was in was in such fear of George Hodel, but was also close buddies with George Hodel, and they were so tight that Man Ray never ever mentioned George Hodel anywhere. There's a little correspondence after Man Ray died where George Hodel is trying to establish, oh yeah, this is a legitimate Man Ray, this that or the other thing, so I can sell it and make some money. Um, there is an autographed um, photo catalog um, that did show up, but I mean, none of that really reflects any deep connection, any deep friendship or fear. You know, George Hodel knew Man Ray. He was an art. He was an arty guy. Of course, he knew Man Ray. That's the kind of thing he would do. Came out for that, used to, you know, um, all of them. So uh, I don't think it. I don't think it could have been solved while he was living. A questioner asks, do you recommend that we start with your first book? And, you know, Steve says, well, you need to read all of my books. It's one big, it's all of a piece. And I said, oh, by the play, because Steve does, has written a play about his father and it features him non-existently poisoning the secretary, you know, poisoning the secretary that he didn't poison. Uh, with, I think he, he put some sleeping pills in orange juice or something like that. Again, to really, to really commit suicide with sleeping pills, you need a lot of pills and you need alcohol. That's how it's done. Otherwise, no. Actually, if you go to my website, Steve, uh, steveodell.com and, and, uh, there's a, uh, and go to the squad room, 
have been blogging for 15 years and all kinds of a massive amount of evidence is presented there. Also, if you go to stevehodel.com, your brain will definitely explode or at least your head will hurt a lot. Let me put it that way. The, the, the reading order is suggested. And, and certainly you start with Black Dahlia Avenger, the 2003 book. But there's a certain order that's probably better to, to, to and I give that on the list of, uh, on the books. Mm -hmm. Somebody, a questioner asks about his book in the mesquite, uh, which I call in the weeds. It's just some random killing that Steve thought was interesting. And he said, oh, well, you know, dad probably did it. Um, dad killed everybody. <laughs> you know, it's just every unsolved murder. Dad did it. Heck yes. Uh, your book in the mesquite? Oh, in the mesquite. I'd rather call it in the weeds. Yeah, uh, as I was um, as I was investigating, uh, I came. I was going to do the early years. Uh, I thought it would be one book, and then I came across a crime in uh, while well, I was a young surgeon in, in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, I came across a double homicide uh, of mother and daughter in El just outside of El Paso, Texas, and I started looking at that, and I realized there's too much here to, I thought it'd be a chapter, the last chapter, it was in 1938. I thought, well, I'll make it a separate book. So I I, wrote, I did In the Mesquite, which is the mother and daughter murder, uh, one of the serial crimes uh, in, in El Paso, and uh, put it, we'll see how that all comes together. And then, uh, but I was gonna make it the last chapter in the book, and I said, no, this is a, gonna be a book in itself, so. I, so that's available in the mesquite as, as, a, uh, as, a, as a separate uh, double homicide. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> it was gonna, like I say, it's supposed to be the last chapter in the early years, but it's a separate book instead, so. Uh, one, of the, one of the participants brings up who is the Black Dahlia. Uh, they talk about that. And then Steve segues into James Elroy, and it, which is always interesting because uh, Elroy was really upset with, with Hodel. Then they made up, then they had another falling out. And now James Elroy refuses to talk about Steve Hodel, he refuses to talk about the Black Dahlia. And he refuses to talk about me, but I don't take that personally. Actually, it's fairly accurate for the most part. I mean, there are a few things that uh, are, but, but basically, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. plays Harry Hansen, who was one of the two primary detectives on the, initially on the case. And uh, they do a pretty good job uh, of, you know, I haven't seen Elroy, James Elroy's Black Dahlia, and I have no, no interest. Oh, yes. Do talk about James Elroy, who um, has been all over the map about Steve Hodel. First of all, he was mad at Steve for saying that George Hodel killed his mom. Then James can't resist uh, getting, getting his mitts on the Black Dahlia. So he wrote the introduction to Steve's paperback version of the book. And now it's like nobody mentioned Steve Hodel. And what's amusing is that James Elroy's inscribed copies of Black Dahlia Avenger ended up on eBay. Oops. Um, yeah. So we're not going to talk about George, uh, pardon me, so we're not going to talk about James Elroy. No. It's all fiction and, you know, uh, stuff. Um, and, and uh, yeah, so, but hopefully we'll be able to get... Oh, and I should mention that James Elroy, like so many other people that have tied up with Steve Hodel, now refuse to discuss him at all. Uh, I wonder why that is. Um, and Elroy also refuses to discuss the Black Dahlia case. I guess maybe when he feels like it, but generally no. Maybe. The truth out on film with this miniseries, which I'm excited. Don't hold your breath on the miniseries. A questioner asks, what is the title of your miniseries? Um, the title for it is Don't Hold Your Breath. That's the title of it. Hodel is a working title, but I don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> One of the participants asks, 
would Steve be willing to later on do a presentation of his investigative skills? And it's like, you don't, these are not investigative skills you want to know anything about. I've talked, I've, I've done some uh, meetings with uh, Sisters of Crime chapter out in Los Angeles uh, years ago, and, and uh, I always enjoy it and all these good questions. And uh, people that I feel actually like to read books. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed talking with you, and, and uh, uh, usually I do it with a with a PowerPoint. Which, because there's so many visuals, so many graphics that really tell the story, and uh, it, it makes it a lot easier. And uh, I do have a tendency to go on and on because there's so much to cover. So much but, to uh, It's a pleasure, and I'm happy to join you this morning. Thank you. Hey, thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay. So that was me reacting to Steve Hodell's interview, and I'm sure I dragged it out to something like two hours. Notice, notice that um, Steve is, and, and this is this is what I wanted to stress, uh, kind of at the end, is notice how Steve is always. Th this is how a police officer lies. Okay. You're always confident, you're always assured, you're always comfortable, you never get ruffled, you never say more than you want to say, you, it's like the minimum. And if somebody brings something up, um, well, you'll, you'll, you'll clarify. Uh, so if, if you, you sense a, an incoming unpleasant fact or an, uh, an unwelcome fact, you'll kind of deflect a little bit. Well, we were living at the Saturn house, except for those three weeks we weren't living there, that kind of thing. Um, uh, Steve's uh, other technique is if he can't talk his way around it, and he will talk, away his, he will talk away his way around the photographs. Um, the photographs are the key point. They're the foundation of everything. And he will say, well, um, I found the photographs um, in my dad's stuff. It, they were the Black Dahlia, both pictures. Okay, neither one is. He will never ever address, the Short family says they're not her. He will never ever confront that head on. He will deflect. It's very, he's very good at it. He'll say, well, it doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter if the pictures are her or not because either they only serve to get me interested in the case, or I don't need them because we have it in the district attorney's files that he knew her or he dated her. Not true, but he'll say that. Um, he will say that um, it just served to get me interested in the case. I've heard him do this. He said, well, it doesn't matter. Um, and then he'll kind of go, oh, well, we have this uh, uh, artificial intelligence software that will say with a 90, 90 something percent accuracy that the photographs are her. He will never say, Steve, look me in the eye, okay? Look at me. The family says your photos aren't her. And without those photos, you have nothing, okay? That's the foundation of everything. Because if the photographs really don't matter, why are they central to his journey, my journey? He says, you know, I did this and that and blah, 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 and that was the beginning of it. Okay, if they don't matter, take them out of your presentation. Just leave them out. Doesn't do that. He talks all the way around it. And if you really, really get him cornered uh, where he can't dispute your facts, Steve will then go in the personal attack. And he does this with me. He'll say, oh, well, Larry Harnish is this sour grapes guy who has been saying the same thing for 20 years. Yeah, Steve, I've been saying the photographs aren't Elizabeth Short for 20 years because they're not her. I will say that with my dying breath. They're not her. Without that, you have no case. Without that, you have nothing. Um, but, you know, he won't, he won't, he will never, ever, ever take that head on. He will deflect. He will go around. Very artful. Um, if you're studying how to lie, study he, Steve Hodel. He's very good at it. He's very convincing. He's very persuasive. Um, I'm not sure you should be studying how police officers lie, but if you want to know how, 
he's good at it. And with that, adios. <laughs>